So we also want to be looking at the, the more micro. Um, so we have two great folks here. Um, Harry Nelson, I'm going to read this because I, I don't know you all really well. But Harry Nelson has over 25 years of experience in manufacturing and sales with numerous high-tech firms. After graduating from Colby College with a BA in Environmental Studies, he went on to receive his MBA from the University of New Hampshire. For the past nine years, Harry has worked at Fluid Imaging, where he is responsible for worldwide sales and product development for Flopan. Heather Ann Wright, who has been with Friends of Mary Meeting Bay before, you on Swan Island, and helped with Friends with a Bay Day um, a year or two ago. Um, Heather Ann has a Master of Philosophy in Life and Biomolecular, Biomolecular Science from the Open University Stazione Zoopologica in Naples, Italy. Yay, Naples, Italy. <laughs> For over 18 years, Heather has been involved in oceanographic research, phytoplankton identification, and biogeochemistry, marine science, and educational outreach. She spent last summer as a wildlife management technician for IFNW on Swan Island. And with her background in particle analysis, uh, Heather has recently been hired to provide technical support to um, fluid imaging technologies for their customers. So welcome, you guys, yeah. for coming, and thank you for doing this. All right. Thanks. You know, this, this, is, this really is fun being here. Um, we started talking with Ed not quite a year ago, and Bethany Brown, who should, she gets the credit for what we're going to be talking about tonight, ran last year's samples. And then Ed said, it'd be great if you could come out here and say, sure, I'll come talk. And you know, it was like May of, that's like, I'm not even thinking about how far ahead that is. I give a lot of talks. I'm a big talker. I talk about selling this instrument. But to be honest with you, my favorite thing to do is, is talk to people about phytoplankton and especially it's, I think we have a really cool story about our company and um, you know Maine is dear, near and dear to me so to be able to talk about this I do do this talks about our instrument in every continent all over the world but when I can just drive from my house and talk to people and then go home and sleep in my bed at night and see my wife that's that's the best thing at all so this is this is really great time to, I've lived in Maine for close to 50 years and I've never been to Bowdoin Island so so great. Anyway, and it's also really cool to have Heather Ann here with me. Um, I've known Heather Ann um, just since I, probably since I began working at Fluid Imaging. And um, what we're going to talk about tonight, I'm going to sort of, we're gonna, we are going to get to the, the algae in Mary Meeting Bay, but, but I'm going to give a little bit of a story, a little business story. Um, it's a successful story um, about our company, and it's... Uh, and how a company like ours comes to be. And I think it's a really cool story. So we're going to spend a little bit of time. It's not business. It's just a, a how government and, and uh, a private enterprise can work together and really smart people that have really cool ideas. So that's kind of what we're going to be talking about. And I'll do the business stuff. Heather Ann will do the science. Um, so we're, we're gonna, I'm going to give you just a little overview about algae, microalgae. And I'll start, actually, by bringing out a quarter from my pocket. So this is about a millimeter. And in the aquatic systems, all, whether they're marine or freshwater, but especially marine, because there's so much more marine, uh, there's so much more ocean than there are freshwater systems, in this size fraction of microorganisms, and we'll be talking about zooplankton and phytoplankton, but also viruses and bacteria, um, this is where everything happens. And, and I know we've all been taught we have limited resources, but every day that big yellow thing pops itself up in the eastern sky and it just pumps all this energy. And through the process of photosynthesis with these little critters down here, they just take that energy, they take the nutrients, the nitrogen and the phosphorus, and then the carbon out of the atmosphere. We're going to talk about carbon and climate change a little bit. And they just do so, that does, they do so many wonderful things to make this earth work. So it's these little bitty guys, less than a millimeter, that are really doing everything uh, for us. We're so lucky for that. So what's the big deal with algae? There's the good algae. These are some images from the, um, the Southern Ocean. Um, Scott Gallagher collected these. Uh, he's from Woods Hole. And they're mostly diatoms and some ciliates. Um, but this is, these are images from a flow cam. And then there's the bad algae. And these are uh, dinoflagellates. This is um, Karenia brevis. This is the, the red tide. You all heard about red tide. We're going to show the red tide from Maine uh, that you see in the Gulf of Mexico. So there's the good guys and the bad guys. But all these guys are photosynthetic. 
They all take um, carbon CO2 out of the atmosphere, they respire oxygen, and, and as many of you may know, and if you didn't know, you should know, half of the every other breath comes from photosynthetic plants, microalgae that are in the ocean. The other half of your breath of the oxygen that we breathe comes from the terrestrial plants that are on, that are on land. So that's another reason why these are important. So I'm really lucky that I get to sell this thing. Um, the, what I'm doing right now is making the case for why do people study, study this kind of stuff. So we're talking about algae. The other term, of course, is phyto from photosynthetic. Plankton and plankton, it's a word derived from the Greek planktos, which means errant or wanderer, which really just means floating around. And that's what these little things do. They just float around in, in the ocean. So algae are uh, primary producers. Um, so here are some, at the, the very basic level, these are the, the cellular organisms, the dinoflagellates and the diatoms that, that take the carbon out of the atmosphere there. They use photosynthetic photosynthesis to uh, create energy and carbohydrates, which are then eaten by the zooplankton. We're gonna show some images of some zooplankton. And we have some copepods and then some shrimp. And then we have the filter feeders that eat on these guys. So this is just the, uh, this is just sort of the trophic stream, if you will, uh, going up to the top predators. And of course, these are not just the top predators. There are other top predators, like us. And we all, I had some great salmon last night, and I love eating salmon. And so do these guys, uh, you know, out in Alaska. And then um, this is, uh, I could, I mean, if we had some, some folks, and Heather Ann could talk about this better than I can, but I will talk just a little bit about the whole biological carbon pump. And this is just the carbon cycle where the CO2 comes out of the atmosphere and you know, the plants, whether they're through photosynthesis on, on the land or, or the microorganisms, the, 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 phyto, the phyto, phytoplankton in the oceans, they're taking the carbon out of the atmosphere, they're respiring oxygen, so that's how we can breathe. And then when these things die, and I have another slide on that, they'll start to sequester the carbon into sediment. And that's actually what, you know, that's what fossil fuels are. Fossil fuels come from either decaying um, organic matter of trees or most of the stuff, especially like in the Gulf of Mexico, that's all coming from, from, uh, from phytoplankton. So and I won't get into, um, we, we actually sell this instrument to a lot of companies that are looking at, they're, they're doing algae technology, algae to biofuels, where they're, they're taking this whole process of algae converting carbon into hydrocarbons, where they do it in about four weeks, whereas in the fossil fuels that we're burning took 400 million years. So it's just incredible what, um, what, what technology is trying to do to, to keep up with energy uh, today. But that's kind of a, a look at the biological carbon pump. And again, at, with this layer here, with the thin layer here where all the photosynthesis takes place, there's lots going on and there's lots of reasons why people will be studying this, why they want to study phytoplankton. So of course, um, you know, we have the good algae and then the bad algae. The bad algae do give us oxygen, but you've probably heard of HABs, which are harmful algal blooms. These are, uh, these are some freshwater HABs, um, and uh, they will, for, for the various toxins, will, will kill animals, whether you drink the water or even if you breathe some of the air with some of the toxic gas that, that's coming off of the harmful algae. This is one reason why they call it red tide, because some of the dinoflagellates, especially the one species in the Gulf of Mexico, when, when you look at them, especially from aerial photographs, they, they do appear red. That's why they call it red tide. But the red tide can be dark, like you see this hab here. And this is a, a picture along the Gulf of Mexico. So I'm going to call, so show you a couple of, of images of some of the different habs taken with a flow cam. So, uh, and this is a big thing, and this is actually where we're starting to, uh, yeah, I, hate, I almost hate to say this, but, you know, I went to college to study environmental science and, you know, save the environment, but climate change, uh, eutrophication, a global, a global warming is causing lots of cyanobacteria issues. This is more of a freshwater problem, but our company is making money from doing this. And um, I mean, we're, we're not like, it's not like we're ambulance chasers, but we are giving scientists a tool to be able to study this kind of stuff. Uh, here is the Karenia brevis, and there they have the uh, toxin that they produce is a brevitoxin. 
and it it's cause, it's a, it's a neuro, causes a neurological imbalance, and it'll, it'll kill you very quickly if you start eating shellfish that have been consuming. You know, the shellfish are all filter feeders, and the, phy the uh, phytoplankton is filtered, and they start to eat these things, and then when you, if you eat them, it just goes right up the food chain, and, and it can kill you. And these are very, very lethal. And then Sudanicha, here's a, a diatom. You get this a lot on the, on the west coast. It's domoic acid, and it's, a, it's also a neurological problem. And if you all remember, and I, if I, whenever I give this talk to high school students, they don't have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> and no offense, I mean, uh, we're all older here, except for Heather Ann and Abby. <laughs> um, but if you remember the movie The Birds, and I'm sure everybody here has heard of the movie The Birds. So the birds were flying around doing these crazy things. Of course, they were crows, but there was a, a shellfish, a paralytic shellfish poisoning episode that took place on the West Coast. This is many, many years ago, and this is what is inspired Alfred Hitchcock to do the movie The Birds, and the, the, the gulls, not the crows, were eating uh, shellfish that had been consuming uh, Sudanicha, and they all got sick, and it's a neurological disorder, and they just started flying around and started attacking people, and that was the inspiration for the movie The Birds. And they changed it to crows because crows are so much more evil looking. <laughs> so just a couple of other hab species. Um, physis, at okadaic acid. So this is diuretic shellfish poisoning. We don't need to talk about what that happens there. But, but keep an eye on this. this. These images came from a fjord in Norway. And I'm going to show you some other images that are closer to home of, of dinophysis. And here is our friend, or maybe not our friend, this is, uh, these images came from a sample collected by Bigelow Laboratories. We're going to talk about them in a minute. And this is the HAB species in Maine, Alexandrium fundiense. They have, uh, the, the toxin is saxitoxin, it's paralytic shellfish poisoning. So if you were to eat a mussel that had been filter feeding with Alexandrium fundiense, not the two other Alexandrium species that you get in Maine, but this guy, and if they had the toxin in, in there, you're going to start to feel tingling in your throat, and you might start to have problems breathing. And if you eat two or three mussels, you know, it's not going to be a problem. But if you eat a dozen mussels, you're going to be dead. So that's, that's where if you're, if you're ever, and I, my wife and I have done this, and she's always saying, Harry, I don't think we should eat these mussels. We don't know if there's a red tide alert. Let's just have a couple of mussels. Let's see what happens. And if it's OK, then we can eat the whole batch. So that's sort of how you can deal with that whole issue. But this is the species. We have closures in Maine. And actually, most of the closures of the shellfish beds in Maine will be because of uh, E. coli coming from sewage treatment plants after a big rain, you know, big water event, a big rain event. But if they are testing, um, we're going to show a picture of someone using the flow cam to look at Alexandrium, um, which is the HAB species in Maine. And by the way, the uh, prediction for this year as far as Red tides in the Gulf of Maine is going to be sort of a normal year. It won't be like it was in 2005. Um, I'm going to put this slide up. Anybody that ever goes to a HAB meeting has seen this a zillion times. Uh, here's, these, these are the HAB events in 1970. There are not too many, mostly on the West Coast, probably Sunanicha. But now, you know, go ahead, uh, whatever, 36 years, and now we're at the 2006. Many more HAB events probably driven a little bit by, um, by climate change, um, more eutrophication, because a lot, you know, all of these organisms, they require light, sunlight to grow, but they also need the nutrients, especially nitrogen and, and potassium, uh, or phosphorus, excuse me, that comes, comes from mostly a lot of from agriculture stuff or from sewage treatment plants. Um, and it, the other reason why we're probably seeing more of these events or recording more of these events. People, there's more observations going on, and it's, it's just a, they're raising the level of, of the way we want to look at measuring the environment. The next couple of slides are just some of the cool images of these things. And I think Ed mentioned that earlier. <laughs> they really are important to study, but they really are cool to look at. When I was a little kid, I did a lot. I got into birding, and just they were so neat to see. And now I'm kind of into phytoplankton. So these next couple of images are just some, some of the cool stuff that we have seen with the flow cam. So this is pyridinium bahamensi. So this is the dinoflagellate that causes bioluminescence. So if, if you go into, this, is, this sample came from Puerto Rico, and if you go into uh, uh, Bio Bay at nighttime and you just put your hand in the water, um, it's, ju it's just unbelievable what you see. So this is that particular organism. 
And when I collected this sample, it really was a total bloom condition, but that's the way it is all the time. And actually, in nature, you, don't, you want to have diversity. You don't, you don't want to have a single organism, but this totally dominated the whole, the whole sample. But it's a pretty cool looking guy. This came from, this sample came from Portland Harbor. Um, actually, I sh let me just go back. This gives you a size idea. This is 50 microns. So 50 microns is 0.5% is of a millimeter. That gives you an idea about the size of that. And here is, that's also 50 microns. So this is at a higher, at a lower magnification, but we're seeing bigger, bigger things. So I can't remember why I went out on the Lucky Catch. Um, it's a boat, it's a sort of commercial party boat. I guess it was, I was partying um, in Portland Harbor. But these are just some of the images that came from Portland Harbor. Um, so Ed had mentioned the zooplankton. So here are some copepods. This is pretty cool. These are, of course, these are all flow cam images. Here's some eggs with the copepods. And here are lots of diatoms, a couple of dinoflagellates. Um, oh, um, it might be hard to see this if I put the next slide down. But I do want to show this guy. So this is Portland Harbor. This is um, dinophysis. So we found that in Portland Harbor. Remember, we saw that in the Norwegian fjord. So it's kind of interesting. We see these samples from all over the world, but we see the same stuff every, everywhere, which is, which is kind, of, kind of neat. I can't remember how many identified species of phytoplankton are. I think it might be 300,000 marine and freshwater, but we do see a lot of the same stuff everywhere. Um, here's a sample from Busan Harbor in South Korea. This is also the same. This is the first size that we were looking at. That's 25 microns. So these are some pretty big diatoms. And when I push this again, here are the two dinophysis. You also see a, a zooplankton anoplii um, and a couple of other organisms. Oh, I, I missed that one there. And these are a hab species. Um, cause lots of problems with salmon in, in Norway. Um, and we're starting to see them along the coast of Maine. I don't know if they're, they're a hab, though, at, at this time. And this is along the Damariscotta River. This sample actually was taken in March. And um, these might be Alexandrium. But when I asked the colleague up there if they were Alexandrium, she said they're, it's too early for the Alexandrium. So we wouldn't see them yet. But anyway, some pretty cool guys. Here's a big ciliate. I love this. This is Thalassiosyra, so it looks sort of like a pearl necklace. And they're just really, really a beautiful um, a diatom to be looking at. So this would be a chain. So they're all, they're all connected with a little set tie that, that can keep them together. And um, I was talking to someone who's, who's uh, paddled the Royal River. So you know these things are in freshwater, too. So uh, I live near, very close to the Royal River, and I do work with the Royal River Conservation Trust. And uh, so this is a sample from the Royal River. These are all diatoms. You know, they all kind of look the same. I mean, they're all these cool-looking little things in the water. So, um, oh, and the last, I think it was my last one of these images. So these are rotifers. These are uh, organisms. This, this sample actually came from um, a group down in Virginia that used rotifers to feed um, larval fish. Um, and they were thinking about buying our instrument to count and identify and uh, size these. But I just think they're beautiful images. So these are the zooplankton that eat the phytoplankton. And you can see all these green chloroplasts in here are some of the microalgae that they've been eating. And um, I also have a picture of the green crab larvae. So we've all been hearing about that. We loaned a flow cam. There's a, a group that was working on studying the green crab larvae last summer. And we've seen this up before with, with people that are getting the flow cam to study either nuisance species or invasive species or hab species. And they get a flow cam, and they don't happen. You know, the, the, thing, the bad thing doesn't happen that summer. So I've always said, well, buy a flow cam, and they just won't come. They don't want, they, they're very shy. They don't want their picture taken. But Darcy Kocher uh, was using the instrument and did some work. And th uh, so this is what the green crab larvae look like. And these are actually really big. That's, that's about a whole millimeter in size. So that's at a, a smaller um, uh, magnification and just it's a much bigger particle. And then the, the another one I wanted to show you, uh, these are what I call Jesus diatoms. And it's really hard to see. But I was at a conference in Daytona Beach. And this woman said, well, why don't you sample 
the, the foam from the, from the ocean, and I go, I said to myself, it's just going to be all this detrital material there. So I grabbed a sample, I ran it, and this is all that I saw. And I call this the Jesus diatom because these little, these are little, you know, these are little silicate shells, and you have this cross on all of these guys. And, and if it's the right orientation, it's very distinct. No one's ever told me what these things are. Um, but there they were, right off the beach, right in front of my fancy hotel in Daytona Beach. Um, and that's all that I saw in the sample, just these really cool little guys. Never, have no idea what they are. Anyway, part of the purpose of this is, yeah, they're all really cool. It's all really fun. But there really is a real strong reason to be studying these things. The next couple of slides um, are going to talk about some of the uh, one particular study that's looking, that's being funded uh, by NASA, the Ocean Color Project. So they're, they're trying to ground truth what the satellites are seeing to what's actually in the ocean. Um, and this is doing a lot of climate change studies. This is Nicole Poulton. She's at Bigelow Laboratories. Um, she's one of the scientists there. And by the way, of course, the flow cam was invented at Bigelow. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. Um, so what they were studying is the North Atlantic spring bloom. So this is the North Atlantic Ocean. These are satellite images. This is the winter. So if you have a lot of yellow, that means there's a lot of phytoplankton in there. These are from satellite images. And in the spring, notice there's not a whole lot in the winter. But come, come springtime, it's really dense, and there's a bloom going on. So the North Atlantic bloom is responsible, they, they think, for 25% of the total global CO2 downdraw by the world's ocean. So in other words, um, I'm going to show you a slide in this. When, when the phytoplankton start to die, or when the, um, the scat or the fecal pellets from the zooplankton, when, you know, they're very dense, they're very nutrient rich, Go down to the ocean to go down to the uh, ocean floor to the benthos. It's, that's sequestering the the carbon. That's one reason why people want to study this stuff. Um, and it's suggested that diatom chains, which are one type of phytoplankton, form the largest aggregates. And these are these really big guys, and they're really really heavy, and they'll sink, and they're taking the carbon. They're coming out of the atmosphere and taking it down to the benthos. Is that bloom an all summer phenomenon? Or it's really more mostly in the month of March. And so you have all these scientists going out there studying that. This is the North Atlantic in March, and I've seen pictures of these. And they, they, they're using ROVs to go collect data. They're doing, um, they're doing um, collecting data with uh, CTD casts, you know, just are, uh, sending it down to the and grabbing samples. Um, whoops, this is probably not working anymore. <laughs> Anyway, um, but this is sort of showing that whole process here. So they're the fecal pellets. But, and this is, this is another diagram. Are you still seeing, hearing me? Okay. So this is just another diagram of, about the whole carbon pump. And here's uh, some of the work being done on the ship. Here's how they're collecting some of the samples. Here's the flow cam. They're doing some microscopy. Here's some flow cam images. And uh, what they're looking at, a lot of what they're looking at is the biomass of these things. And they have these correlations between how large these things are with how much with, with their biomass is. And a lot of their biomass has carbon. And that carbon came from the process of photosynthesis. And this is what they're sequestering and taking it down to the ocean floor. So now we're going to get to the business part. That's a little, some talk about phytoplankton. So, why a flow cam? Well, there really is a very strong need to study this stuff. I wish, and science, many of the scientists wish there was more money devoted to studying this. If there were, we would all be making more money here in Maine. So why a flow cam? And the way you've been traditionally been doing this in the past is, of course, with a microscope. But if you have a flow cam, you can just smile at the camera, and you don't have to do anything, and it does all the work for you. So automate and be happy. And I'm just going to give a, a, sh a quick little um, show this. So this guy, Mark Benfield, he wrote an article, an opinion article in Nature magazine. It's just talking about um, why we need to um, automate identification. And this doesn't matter if you're looking at little coccolithophores, which Barney Bolch is uh, at Bigelow Lab Studies, or mosquitoes, or whatever that thing is, or plants. Um, if you can automate identification, you can get so much more scientific data 
so much more quickly. So with that in mind, these two guys, Charlie Inch, who was the founder of Bigelow, and Mike Seraki, who really at the time was there, this is going back to the 20 years ago, it was 20 years ago, 1995, um, got together and actually over um, with a friend of theirs that was working at the um, uh, Institute for, Marine, from, for Blood Research in Scarborough, I forget the guy's name, but he's using a flow cytometer and they're looking at um, um, fluorescent emissions that come from, from blood when they're excited by a certain laser. And Charlie was saying we can do the same thing with a laser to, to excite um, the chlorophyll that are in cells. And why can't we do something to automate the way we identify cells and take pictures of cells, so, of, of algae. So Charlie and Mike got together with Chris Seraki, and that's Mike's brother. Chris lives in Edgecombe. He started our company. And Chris is an optical physicist and said, hey, why don't you come work for us? And let's, let's try to prove this concept of some imaging flow cytometry. And what they wanted to do, they were doing that kind of work with flow cytometry in smaller size range of particles under 10 microns, but they wanted to look at bigger things because that's where the flow cytometer won't work very well, up to a millimeter in size. Remember earlier my little coin show? And these were a lot of the larger phytoplankton and the microzooplankton reside. So that's where they said, Chris said, okay, I'm going to start working with you guys. So they worked on the proof of concept with what was called the BIFPIUS, the Bigelow Inflow Particle Imaging and Analyzing System. <laughs> and you guys will relate to this. This is a Gateway 400 computer. It's the first computer that the Nelson household ever owned. There's a microscope. There's a camera. Look at the size of the camera. That's about 8 inches. They had two microscope slides with a piece of... Um, of uh, stainless steel that, that separated it so they could send uh, some sample through. And Chris took it on the uh, this, this ship, the Edward Lane uh, University of, Ma of uh, Maryland, and they proved the concept. So with that idea, um, they applied for an NSF grant. And um, I'm going to get just a little, little political here just for a second, but it's really cool. A couple weeks ago, I went up to Bigelow. They brought a bunch of legislatures down, legislators down from uh, Augusta, because there's just been this idea by our governor to start taxing nonprofits. And yeah. if they start taxing Bigelow, they have this beautiful campus, and they would lose three scientists to pay for their taxes. Mm -hmm. And there is no way in hell they would ever have, if they were being taxed, to have the funds available to try this crazy idea that Chris and Mike and Charlie had. So I love the fact that, and they brought me up there because here's a success story. We have 30 employees. We're paying taxes, all this stuff. Maybe we don't. I, I think you guys all probably align with my politics. <laughs> but anyway, if, if it wasn't for the National Science Foundation giving a grant, the Maine Technology Institute saying this is a good idea, we, we're actually working on a, a half a million dollar um, an unsecured loan coming from them to develop our next level of technology. So it's pretty cool. So anyway. They developed the, the flow cytometer and microscope called the FlowCam. The first one ever was sold to uh, Suzanne Strom at U University of Western Washington. I actually got an email from her today. Here's the second FlowCam ever built that was in the Seraki lab. It's still being used today. And they, every Wednesday they do a doc study. And that FlowCam is 15 years old. So when the funding was exhausted, Chris, invented, Chris started Fluid Imaging Technologies. He was in an uh, office in East Booth Bay, which just happens to be where um, Bigelow Labs is now located. I don't know if any of you have ever been out there, but it is a really, it's the most beautiful building I've ever been in in my life. Of course, it looks out on the South Bristol, right on, uh, on, on the Amstown River. Our first sale was in 1999 to Suzanne. Ken Peterson was the first hire as the CEO in 2002. And then uh, we established a home office in Edgecombe. This is a picture outside of my office window, and it was a bedroom, and I shared with two other people. And there are a bunch of turkeys, and I thought we were all a bunch of turkeys to be working there then. Mm -hmm. um, and then we moved to a real office in, North, in, in Yarmouth in 2007, and then to a, our office now in Scarborough, where I think there's about 30 of us a couple of years ago. And just, and just what we do, um, I don't need to go through all this, but... You know, the instrument was invented um, to study doing aquatic research, to looking at these tiny little things in the water. Um, 
and we, we're doing all these different types of things. Uh, I should also mention that we're, we have a lot of municipal water companies that are using our instrument to look at um, um, taste and odor algae and other algae cyanobacteria in drinking water, which is a, a quite an issue. Um, and we also have a lot of uh, this. This represents about half of our business, the aquatic research and, and, and monitoring, and the other half is what we call the industrial applications. Uh, we have a lot of folks, you know, if you think about it, you're doing rapid microscopy with our instrument. Um, so if you're doing, looking at pharmaceutical drugs, especially parental drugs, which are these protein aggregates, or food, yeast analysis, uh, and actually a big market for us now, we're doing a big research project or product development uh, with oil and gas, looking at drilling muds and produced water. Um, just talking a little bit about some of our reach. Uh, we were, we're in 45 countries, and we should very soon be in Thailand, Kazakhstan, which is there, I've learned, and also Mexico. We don't have an instrument in Mexico yet. And these are just some of our users. It does show you a little bit about the, uh, that's the, that's the Bigelow flow cam. This is second generation flow cam. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the Terra Oceans Project, this really cool consortium of of uh, 30 different organizations all around the world that are studying marine microbes, and they put this, they, they put a flow cam on a, on a ship, a French a sailboat, traveled all around the world. There's a portable model in the Gulf of Mexico, and that's our current model there with Tony Peterson. And just some other flow cam users. Um, this is Alison Saroy at um, Maine DMR, so they are using the flow cam to study uh, the red tide in Maine. Um, and some other folks, and when I, I have this, I'll have to show you this one. Uh, this is Hebrew University. When the Cole Fulton went to train them, everybody would like to have a flow cam that they could put in the water, an in-situ device to get real-time uh, sampling. So that was his idea. We could jump in the ocean, you've got your snorkel, and you could get real-time data. Um, we have tried to do that and yeah. sort of failed doing that. And here's another picture, and, and Heather Ann and I, yeah. I've done this talk before, but there's Heather, Ann, there's Heather Ann at the Isle of Shoals. <laughs> I forget what year that was. 2000, it was yeah. summer of 2010. And then a bunch of, a bunch of other customers. Unbeknownst to me, he's been... Yeah. <laughs> had me in this presentation. Yeah. So, um, so with a flow cam, users are happy. Um, I really think this guy's going to get a no. They don't give a Nobel Prize for, for ecology or which I think is really wrong, but if they will, this, this guy's going to get it. He's a guy, he's a, one of our scientists, flow cam user in, in Taiwan. So that's my part of the talk, and I think the next slide. I'm going to pass it over to Heather Ann, and so that's sort of the business and why people are doing this, and the Heather Ann will talk about Mary Mae and Becky. Do, do you need me to... Station break. Station break. <laughs> all right, I know you're all very eager to see what was in Mary Meeting Day, so um, the next portion of the talk will cover what we saw in your samples. Um, and so it's rather fortuitous that I'm actually um, incorporated into the. Yep, here. I never wear these things, so. Anyhow, um, I came about. Uh, Ed's effort to incorporate the, the flow cam as, as a research tool um, serendipitously. I was out in Swan Island last summer, here um, in the bay, pretty much, all summer. Thank you. Um, so actually, I was working out on Swan Island all summer, uh, just right up, up the river. And um, I found a newsletter from the Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, and I, I looked at the, the front part of the newsletter and I said, wait a minute, what's going on here? And so uh, I read the article and I said, wait a minute, Friends of Mary Meeting Bay is using a flow cam to do a study in this area and I didn't know about it? What's going on? Harry? <laughs> in fact, I think that even uh, prompted a, an email follow-up later on at the end of the summer. I said, hey, Harry, by the way, guess where I am and guess what I ran into? So you never know um, what, what's going to happen and Maine is sort of a great place like that. We're all sort of pretty well connected in the sciences when it comes right down to it. So fortunately for, for you folks, you acquired an instrument loan. I don't know the period of time. Unfortunately, I was out on the island, and so I didn't actually participate in the sampling. Um, but the samples were brought out to our office, and 
we'll go through that a little bit. And um, we're here to give you a little bit of insight into what's in the bay, which you can't see. So um, Ed detailed a little bit about the sampling. And you were actually out for the actual sampling, along with another volunteer who I don't think is present here today. He was driving the boat. Um, and he sent me some wonderful photos. And the samples occurred in three different um, regions within the bay. And I've done a very poor job at reconstructing this. I hope that's relatively correct within, <laughs> within my ability here. So he sent me um, the different sampling sites. So we have up here in the Eastern River, the ER site. We have down here and right here in this region. This is probably the furthest within the Bay region, would you, would you agree? And just there's different depths that were sampled. Um, so we won't go into a lot of detail about that, but a little bit of description. So what it involves when you take a plankton tow, if you've never done one before, you do need to tow it. Either you can tow it by hand if you're, you're on a boat and you have it on a rope, or you need to pull it alongside um, the end of a boat. And you tow it through the water at a specific depth or at the surface for a period of time. And then you bring it up and you have a concentrated sample that filters down through a specific mesh size. And then you take that aliquot after you filtered it through your net. And that's what you use to run, run your sample through and look under a microscope to see what's there. In this case, you utilize the flow cam to analyze your samples. So I'll just give you a little bit of insight into that. This is what actually occurred. So how do we get from the middle of Merry Meeting Bay to the samples. How do we see those tiny little plankton that are within the sample? Well, you can't see much here. So again, you have to tow your, your net. Um, and here is Ed at the end of, oops, excuse me, right here, um, at the end of the process along each sample site. Um, after you filter down through the, through the net, there's a cod end portion, and that concentrates it. And then you take an aliquot of 100 mils. So for each sample, we effectively had three different 100 mil samples. So might not sound like a lot. Trust me, it was more than enough sample. We've got plenty of data. Um, we were actually able to do several successive runs um, at our lab. And so what we did was bring back these samples to our facility in Scarborough where we actually have something called a particle analysis service, where um, similar things such as um, what we're describing here, where say somebody doesn't have a flow cam, but they're really interested in, well, can I use this instrument for my research? Um, maybe, maybe they can run a sample for us. And so we actually offer a service where the, whereby they can submit a sample. And we process it in-house at our facility, and we provide them the data. And then if it's somebody who's potentially interested in purchasing a flow cam, for example, we can work with those, um, those, those interested parties to develop instrumentation that might be specifically appropriate for what their needs are. And so because we're still a small company, we try to accommodate that very well. Um, and so this is actually, I don't know if Harry actually had an up close and personal of a flow cam, but this is the flow cam itself. Um, and it usually um, consists of both a monitor where you view your samples and the actual, actual instrument itself, which processes the sample. And it really has three different components. It has an optics, and it has a fluidics, and it has an electronics component to it. And each one of these <laughs> operates to run your sample through a fluid medium within this tubing, and it comes out, processes, processed through um, an optic system with a camera, and specific objectives as if you had objectives on a microscope. Think of it really as the flow through portion here. And literally what's passing through your stream, through your optics, is visualized simultaneously, real time, right there as it's capturing. So I don't have, um, we can actually open up a run and show people how yeah, we. You want to see it at the end, we can yeah, do that. Absolutely. Um, but literally you're sitting right next to the instrument as is Bethany, who processed the samples for Mary Meeting Bay. And she's watching um, the samples visualize. And she's also um, monitoring, monitoring the screen as, as they're running through the instrument. So she's operating the instrument. She's looking at the data immediately. Um, and she's also making decisions. Like, for example, see your, your samples here? They're very concentrated. So just remember the color of, of these sample bottles. And that, that will give you a little bit of insight into what we're seeing 
when we when we have the end data. And, and we didn't those those were hundred milliliter samples, and we <laughs> didn't run those. We just took like a ten milliliter mm. sample from that, and ten milliliters gave us over two hundred thousand pictures. Yep, and in some cases even more. Yeah. So as I parsed through the data and I took a look at it, and I was mm. like, wow, these are these are pretty rich. Um, there was no shortage of data with which to work with. And sometimes that's a really good thing. And other times it can be, well, you have the data, but what are you going to do with it? So you should really ask yourself, this is where the research um, component of this particular process comes into play. So what kind of ecological questions might you have if you were doing this initially? Well, first of all, you may never have seen any of the phytoplankton or zooplankton community in this body of water. So you just want to know what's there. Um, how much of what's there in this case in a freshwater system or say even a drinking water reservoir You would want to know whether it's toxic bloom forming um, When is it there? Do we have to be concerned about it? Um, what is this an indicator of the health of the ecosystem or perhaps the food availability for other organisms? How healthy is the bay? So I don't know exactly what your research questions were, but all of those kind of questions are what you can be thinking about, and this is what this tool is specifically will help you do in, in aquatics research. Now, if you were in water process, as Harry described, you would be more focused on particular target species. Um, so this is one of your sites here. You're all very interested to see what's in each site. This is just a representative um, snapshot of what's in here. No, so we ran the, we were running the samples on a 4x objective, um, and the instrumentation um, comes with four different objective settings: 2x, 4x, 10x, and a 20x. Um, so depending, you know, on the on the size of your organisms, that that will determine what the capabilities of the instrument are in terms of detecting it. But I find things at the moment that are much smaller than really five five microns become at least difficult to identify in terms of to the species level, for example. If you just want to count things and you don't want to identify them, you have no idea what they are, but you know they're very, very small, you can still quantify and say something about the small sized fraction of your of your community. So you can you can take your samples, even though they were filtered through a specific mesh size for the plankton toe. Um, you can also do another pre-filtering. So this is something I didn't touch on, but when, you, when you're in the lab, before you even run your sample, you want to think about, well, do I have a lot of bulky things? Are they all going to settle out? And if I just pour off gently the top uh, one mil of my sample or pipette it out, I might be missing the whole snapshot. You know, it's, it's not representative. So you might have to do some pre-filtering and kind of cleaning of your sample. There's a little bit of prep that goes into obtaining very high quality images in order to get high quality output data as well. In this case, we didn't filter anything out. Um, we just captured everything we could just to get an idea of what was there. So again, this was the Eastern River site. And this, this is the other location. If you notice what's really cool here, um, this is definitely a Seracian species. You see slightly, slightly different species. Um, what, I, what I noticed about all the samples, just in general, a lack of lots of zooplankton. But just keep that in mind as, as you look at some of the other images when we go through. Again, so these are just a snapshot. Literally, you have hundreds of thousands of particles in each of these samples. So the person uh, on your end wants to know, well, what can I do with this? These are lots of beautiful pictures, but we'd like to ID them. How do we do that? So oh, in here, actually, this is really interesting. So this is the, is you're calling this the nursery. nursery, nursery OK, and this was I also think. taken at the shallowest depth, and that's pretty important. So um, it was taken at a, at a depth of four, is that well, right? Well, Closer. all taken at the surface because they didn't okay. have a downrigger. Because you were, they oh, were okay. taken you in to, different areas. It wasn't so on the boat with you. This was the shallowest of the okay. areas. So it was only like four feet deep. OK. Yeah. What do you guys notice about this one that may be a little bit different from this one? 
Yeah, far more round guys in this one. <laughs> far more squiggly guys in this one. <laughs> and a, a fair amount of squiggly guys and straight guys in this one, right? Yeah. So we're looking for for those kind of categories. And you can start at a crude level. You don't have to be a taxonomist. You don't have to be a scientist. You can just look at this and say, well, there looks like there's more squiggly. There looks like there's way more round. That's really important because those round ones are centric diatoms. And those diatoms are super important. So we can start saying something about this sample without doing anything else. You guys have already started the process of working through your samples. <coughs> Now, the interface with the FlowCam instrumentation also has another very important component with it, which is a proprietary software that's been developed at Fluid Imaging. So we use the proprietary software in here, and it's called Visual Spreadsheet. And what it allows us to do is everything from the acquisition of the actual data, from running the sample and looking at it, to the final end product of sort of processing it and classifying it. So this is an example of what I actually went through when I took a look at your data. And I utilized our classification tools, which actually this is, this is the classifier with a machine learning process now that enables you to sort out your sample, section off, and run an um, algorithm that identifies and tells the machine and learns how to recognize these particles. It's pretty sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of um, development that went into this, and it's a pretty powerful tool. So over the years that I've worked with a flow cam, from the original <laughs> slide mounted on a microscope with some tubing <laughs> in 1997, all the way up to what we have now. I've seen a remarkable progression of what the capabilities are, both of the instrumentation itself, but also in the software end of it. And it's just fantastic for somebody who has poured over taxonomic ID books and sat at a microscope for a long time. This, this is now enabling me to section out your data and classify it. So what I did was determine these categories, and forgive me if I've I've missed some for sure, absolutely. Um, but I've set up a number of different classification types. This is Asterionella. I have Anabina, Pediastrum. I've made a bulk category for the centric diatoms because they're pretty diverse and we have a wide size range as well. Um, I've also set up a category. I've actually determined it was microcystis, which is very important. Uh, we have spirulina. We have some blue greens. We have ovoid flagellates. I have pennate diatoms, some zooplankton. I'm just calling it triangles. I have a triangular diatom. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it's got lots of great triangles. Yeah. Um, so it gives you an idea of how you would work through your data and what you can do with it. So you <laughs> sort of develop this uh, training set for it, or you can work from a set of libraries. So you can take the best images from your data that it captures, and then you can tell the system well, every time you see this particle, you know it's an Asterionella. So what I want you to do, you're telling the instrument, learn how to recognize this shape based on these properties that each unique particle has that the instrument can capture, and then it will parse it out and put it in these categories for you. It's just, it's phenomenal. It really is. It's a really powerful tool. And I had a lot of fun doing it, too. A little bit of frustration along the way, figuring out what was the right way to go about it. But um, So this is an example. At the end of, say, a classification routine, you've collected your data in the field. You've run it through the flow cam instrumentation. You've run a classification. You've decided how you want to ID things. Well, that's not enough. You just are still left with lots of pretty pictures. They just have types and names on them now. What do you do with it? You want the data. Like any scientist, show me the data. So the software also has a uh, functionality in it whereby it allows you to export data. And because you've assigned a unique classification type or species taxonomic ID with each particle in the categories, when you export your data, it actually provides you real numbers and then concentrations based on your volume of sample run with, with the categories that you've, you've ID'd. So it's pretty exciting because that all happens pretty quickly, depending on how much you want to fiddle with your, with your data. Um, so I was able to do that with your data. And what I actually ended up doing when I um, 
obtain the data was um, separating out all the categories. I shifted around the data a little bit in the spreadsheet so that I had a, a clear understanding of what the, the data looked like. Oops. And then I exported it out and I did a little graph for you guys to show, to show you an example of some of your, your community. Oh, okay, so I wanted to show you this site specifically because um, out of all the pop uh, all the samples that I ran, um, the population here in microcystis was, I guess I would say, dense enough to be of interest. And I'm not sure I would say concern. I think we would need to dig a little bit deeper into it. But I think both Harry and I agree on, on this, that the microcystis presence um, here is something of, of noteworthy. This is a cyanobacteria. <laughs> and it has the microcystin. Yeah. EPA has levels of microcystin levels in, in freshwater systems. And most, most, of these al most of these algae we're seeing are all freshwater. Um, yep. I mean, they're, they're in the basin estuary, but they all look to be fresh, freshwater species. Um, and the presence of microcystis does not necessarily mean there's microcystin, the toxin. You know, whether you're talking a saxitoxin from Alexandrium or microcystin from microcystis, they're bad things. I showed you the dead cow earlier. That was that cow was killed by drinking water that had microcystin in it. And they think that the, and it's really interesting, they don't really know why, when I say they, the scientists, we, I mean, certainly not me, I'm not a scientist. Um, why do these organisms produce this? And it, they think it's sort of towards the end of the bloom when they start to produce it, and, I, and that's probably, you know, it's an evolutionary thing. We're gonna, we're at the end of the bloom, we're gonna start to die out, so we wanna kill everything off, so we can come back and, and do this all again. They run out of nutrients. But it's just, you know, from, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's really interesting to talk to some of these scientists, they don't really know why the hell these organisms produce this. Because the shellfish don't know when they're, they're eating it, and they're the things that are eating these bad things. After all this time, it's, it's amazing. We still don't like, know. Little science. Yeah. <laughs> the summer that I worked out on the Isle of Shoals, which um, operates a marine research laboratory seasonally with Cornell University mm -hmm. and uh, University of New Hampshire, um, they had a microcystis bloom in their freshwater drinking supply. And it was pretty alarming. Um, and it just so happened it coincided with a serendipitous flow cam loan when we were out there and we said, hey, Let's take a look and see what's in here because we, we want to know. Obviously, it was microcystis. It set off sort of a red flag, and we said, oh, we've got to know. Um, is this going to compromise the potential only freshwater drinking supply that they have to treat on the island for you know the, the students who are out there on that facility during the summer? It's a remote island. It's the only freshwater supply in the middle of the Isle of Shoals in the in the Gulf of Maine, so we tested it, and we actually confirmed it with the flow cam, but then followed it up um, for chemical confirmation. We actually sent it down to a research lab, I think in Georgia, where they confirmed it was not toxic. So that was a good thing, but the presence of microcystis is, is something noteworthy. Um, and so in terms of the results, um, what I did was extrapolate to um, a final concentration, if you will, based on these sort of categories that I was looking at. So this isn't necessarily everything, and it's not representative of each specific area. I chose to focus on the Eastern River first sample, um, but it's fairly straightforward to go, go through and do the same thing for each of the sites. Um, so what we have here is just on your x-axis, you have the different sort of categories. And um, one thing I didn't mention, because you probably couldn't see it in the other uh, view in the classification, I made a category for two very important things. First is something that's very difficult for anybody, microscope or not, to detect. The five micron and less category, of which there are always, as you can see, plenty. <laughs> And we can't really say much about them, but we don't want to neglect that portion of the, the plankton community because chances are you might have a cyanobacteria. Maybe you, you, you won't know necessarily. You don't want to omit it. We also have a significant portion in your samples of what I'm calling flock 
uh, potentially detritus. I can't confirm that it's absolutely detritus, but we'll, I'll give you a couple more insights into why I'm calling it flock as well. The reject category <laughs> are images that are not of high enough quality um, or clarity in their focus when they're going through the, the sampling process um, through the instrument in which to be able to do anything with. Sometimes it may be bubbles, it could cut, um, cut some of the images depending on the processing. And so it's a bin that actually occurs when you're classifying your samples, that's all. So um, you can see in this, in this particular site that your PD astrum was in fairly high concentration. There were a decent amount of centric diatoms. Kind of tried to keep the diatoms over there. And again, this category of the five micron was pretty significant, and that's not surprising. But just some things to, to keep in mind about this, this particular data from Mary Meeting Bay. What I noticed is that there's a nice variety. You have a strong diversity in the freshwater taxa. Um, the consideration of tidal fluctuation is very interesting. So we're seeing all freshwater. We know it's, it's not saline at all, not even brackish. Um, but one thing to consider because of the tidal fluctuations is, and the hydrography uh, in the area um, are potential things such as cysts. Now, Harry didn't necessarily mention cysts, but um, what, the, what these are are a life stage of certain organisms, certain phytoplankton taxa, and they actually um, will remain dormant within the sediments at the base of a, of a river, I say at the mouth even, um, and under the right environmental conditions, temperature or light or even turbidity, um, these cysts can be triggered to um, induce the organism. And so that's something that has been looked at in the past. The, the flow cam can be used to identify a cyst. It's not something I particularly focused on in here, but it is something to keep in mind that that might be an indication of other organisms. Um, you may not be able to identify it. You might see a cyst, but in the future, if you see that organism sort of appear, that may be a potential reason why. Um, I want to mention very specifically the phytoplankton to zooplankton ratio. Where are all the zooplankton? Um, these samples were collected, I believe, July, July 13th of last summer. Um, and coming back to what Harry mentioned about the microcystis, we see a fair amount in there. I don't know if something had already bloomed. We don't know what the zooplankton, I don't really have a good feel for what the characteristics, normal characteristics are of the zooplankton community or the successional pattern. But there was a noticeable low amount of zooplankton in our samples. Most of them were diatom dominated. Um, they were fairly homogenous, so even though the ratios of other species varied, they seem to have this, the same composition, which is not surprising because it's not that far apart from each other in the sampling sites. Um, again, I want to mention the detrital material or possibly flock from the turbidity and the tidal bore in this area. So I saw a lot of de, what I'm calling detritus, but it's particles and materials in the samples that were all clumped together. And so it was fairly difficult to tease out. I could see a diatom and I see the curly Q, but I see a lot of material stuck to it. So if that is um, churned up sediment or detrital matter off of, of the, the bottom, um, if you saw, you saw the picture of the samples in the lab, the color of the bottles, remember? The sort of olive green murky color. So we know the Kennebec River moves very quickly, has a good tidal range, and that's a very important consideration for these samples. The seasonal cycles of all organisms, including plankton, have a specific sort of timing. And I don't know the successional patterns in Mary Meeting Bay whatsoever. And like I said, this is a snapshot. So we have an, a starting point from which to say, well, maybe if we go out again at this specific time, let's see how it's so different. Maybe there's going to be an unusual storm event. We have a lot of runoff and into the, into the system. Things are gonna look a lot different. So it's important to frame it in the context of how um, you see things on a seasonal cycle. And I hope this has given you a snapshot view um, and some insight into what, what is in there. There's a lot of, 
lot of plankton there. 